Hey, this message in this series was provoked by a conversation I had last year with my oldest son. He attends Greenwood Christian Academy. Uh, and in our conversation uh, about his day at school, he was telling me that in their Bible class, they were having a conversation about the judgments mentioned in the Bible. And uh, he was a little bit concerned when he shared with me. He said, Dad, no one in the class knew about the Bema Seat or the Great White Throne Judgment except me. And I was taken aback by that. The teacher of the Bible class is a pastor. And so as he began to talk about these particular things, he was asking them, how many of you know anything about these things? And, and not a single student raised their hand. Now, most of them had never heard of them. People don't know about perhaps the single most important day in their lives. The fact that each of them will stand before God and give an account of their lives. A day when everything they have said or done will be examined by God himself and tested with fire. And as a result of this day, this is how they're going to live the rest of eternity. They don't know anything about that. There's no planning for that. It's like having the most important test in your life and not being prepared for it. It would be the, how many know it would be the ultimate pop quiz, right, on Judgment Day if you did not know this examination was going to happen. Now, I realize that judgment is not a popular topic anywhere these days, even in churches. But uh, and, and as a result, a lot of churches don't talk about it. But that's like having a teacher announce to you, hey, everybody, there's going to be a test today. And all of the stuff on this test is really, really hard. It was so hard that I knew if I talked about it in class, you wouldn't like it. So I ignored it. But good luck. Charles Stanley put it this way. When you were born, the clock started ticking and your day of judgment is getting closer every time a second ticks. Tick. Talk. You feel it yet? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Here's the theme verse of this series. People are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. How many times are you going to die? One time, the scripture says. What's going to happen after you die? You're going to face judgment. Now, that means everybody, every man, every woman, every teenager, every boy, every girl is going to die one time and they're going to face judgment. Every Russian, every person from Africa, every person from America, we're all going to die once and after that face judgment. This applies to everybody, Christians and non-Christians. Every person who's ever lived at any time will stand before God and give an account of their lives. This is going to be fun. So today we're going to talk about those judgments. We're going to begin with the Bema Seat here today, the Bema Seat Judgment or the Judgment Seat of Christ. Next week we're going to talk about the Great White Throne Judgment, and that's the judgment where all unbelievers will stand before the Lord. Two weeks from today we're going to transform this platform, and it's going to be an illustrated sermon called The Ten Witnesses. And we're going to follow the lives through a dramatic fashion through people uh, who, who die and who stand before God and face eternity. You'll want to invite everybody you know uh, to that two weeks from today. And then three weeks from today, we're going to talk about a subject that I don't know that I've ever heard anybody preach about. And it's the judgment of nations. So you're saying, well, pastor, why are you preaching about this? And my son asked me earlier this week, he said, dad, are you trying to scare everybody? Well, let me give you a few reasons why I feel compelled to preach this. Here's a few reasons. First of all, it's preparation. How many know if you had a final exam but had no idea it was coming, you would not be prepared? You don't want this day to come upon you as a pop quiz, right? They always warn you, be prepared for the final exam. Some of you are college students right now. Let me go ahead and tell you, don't wait until the last minute to prepare for the final exam. And God is wanting us to prepare. How many know God does not want anybody to be unprepared, right? If you are prepared, listen to me clearly. If you are prepared, you have nothing to worry about. As a matter of fact, you can leave today with confidence and look forward to the day you get to stand before God on this day of judgment. So you kind of, I guess I would call this judgment day for dummies. Thank you for laughing. You bless me when you do that. I know it's because it's Pastor Appreciation Day, but thank you so much. Now listen, if you're not prepared for this day, you should be afraid. You should be very afraid. 
So we want to make everybody prepared. The second reason to share this series is motivation. We need to be motivated. So today I'm your motivational speaker. So because you're going to be rewarded according to what you do here on the earth. So you might want to get started now working on those rewards when you get to heaven. How many know not everybody's going to be equal in heaven? I know sometimes we treat salvation as just a get out of hell free card and as long as I'm in heaven, it's okay. Trust me, that's a great reward. But not everybody's going to be equal in heaven. Some will have more than other folks. So you want to be motivated, all right, in your good deeds, in your helping others, in your heart. I'm motivated to do good, to serve others, to stop wasting time. Because much of what we are investing our lives in will burn up on judgment day. So I want to motivate you to do good things. The third reason is sanctification. Sanctification is a, is a $10 theological word that simply means holiness. How many know the accountability of these judgments will enable you to live a holy life? To not go along with the crowd. To learn to say no to sin and compromise. The power, it's the power of accountability. Because I'm looking forward to the day when the Bible says everything will be made known. All of my secrets will come to light. How many know that will motivate me to live holy, right? And to choose righteousness and to choose purity. Instead of going along with the crowd, I'm going to be separate. That's what holiness means, by the way. To be separated from the world. And here's the last reason I'm going to be preaching this series is salvation. For many, talking about this is going to result in their salvation. We're talking about this because people need to be ready. They need to get right with God. You need to be prepared to live eternally, not to be condemned in the judgment, but to be rewarded in the judgment. And that's our heart. That's our motivation. We want you to be ready. There's an old song people used to sing. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? I mean, doesn't that just thrill your soul? We want you to be ready. So let's talk about this first judgment mentioned in the Bible. It's the Bema Seat Judgment or the Judgment Seat of Christ. Now the Bible talks about the Judgment Seat of Christ uh, in three places. Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 uh, through the rest of the chapter, and chapter 4, verse 5, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. So this is a, a great opportunity after this message is over, go home and read those verses. And Pastor Jason's going to post an illustrated sermon or a drama about this message today that's on Right Now Media. You'll want to watch that sometime here today and be blessed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, we must all, everybody say all. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So guess what? You, the Bible says that everybody who's a follower of Jesus is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So let's give a little background. When is this going to happen? When is the judgment seat or the Bema seat going to happen? I've, I've got a little outline here on the screen. It's also in your message notes to give you a little bit of a diagram as far as when this is going to happen. Now, this is, this is not hopefully too complicated, but we are in the church age right now. So we're in the age uh, right before the rapture of Jesus Christ. So you see that there, uh, that first line going up is the rapture. Okay, and then following that will be the tribulation here on the earth for seven years. The Bible says that two thirds of the people on the earth will die during the tribulation. I know there's some left behind movies and books that kind of romanticize those days here on the earth. It will be anything but romantic. It will be judgment to the nth degree. Two thirds of the population on the earth will die. While that's going on here on the earth, we will be raptured. All the followers of Jesus will be raptured into heaven. And the first thing that happens after the rapture is the judgment seat of Christ. That's the first judgment, okay? So that's the first judgment that people are going to participate in. Now you say, Pastor, is that the first thing that's going to happen? Well, I, I'm thinking, I don't, I'm thinking when we first get raptured, you know, we could do a little rapture practice here today, right? <laughs> When you first get raptured, we sang all these songs here this morning. When we first get raptured, I don't think we're going to go immediately to the judgment seat. I got a feeling God's going to give us a little bit of time to react and get happy 
You know, we sing this song, I can only imagine. Who knows how we're going to react when we get caught up together in the, with the Lord in the air and we get to be in heaven. Hey, we made it. I, you know, I went to the New England <coughs> Patriots game a few years ago for my 40th birthday. My wife got them for my, for my birthday. And we were at the fourth down game. Anybody remember the fourth down game? All right, when Belichick, Belichick, I mean, Belichick um, went for it on fourth down because he was so afraid of that guy that played for us. You know, and then they, they stopped him. You know, and, and I'm going to tell you what, grown men started hugging each other and crying. I mean, we're walking out the door and people I didn't know are high-fiving me and hugging me. I'm like, I guess it's okay. Yeah! Right. And, I, and literally, I mean, it was crazy. A thought occurred to me. This is just a tiny glimpse of craziness. It's going to happen. Those first moments were translated in heaven. Hey, I don't know you. Who made it? Who bear hug for Jesus? Come on, somebody. It's going to be awesome. Family reunions. Loved ones that have already gone there. I'm going to see my brother. We're going to see people running across the throngs of heaven just like we see in the video. Dun, 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 dun. Do you never think about this? I think about this all the time. You know, it's just going to be everybody will be up. There's a reason people write all these songs. Because you really are going to be happy over there. No more cancer. No more wheelchairs. No more sorrow. No separation. Come on, somebody. However long it takes us to celebrate, however long uh, we get the opportunity to do that, after this, the judgment seat of Christ will begin. Now, in earth years, if you see on the screen, in earth years, it's going to last about three and a half years. But we know that God exists outside of time, and so does heaven. And so uh, we're not saying that it's going to last exactly three and a half years. But how many know if every individual has to stand before God who, who has ever been a follower of Jesus, it's going to take a little bit of time, right? And we all get to be there. I mean, imagine, you know, this place were crowded like it should be in two weeks. Come on, somebody. Every seat's filled in two weeks. And multiply that times a million. And then there's you and God. Except they're not that way. Everybody's, whoo, whoo, whoo. It's going to take a few minutes. So, pastor, how soon could this judgment take place? Well, let me help you out for a second. Anybody believe that the rapture of the church is imminent, could happen any moment, any day? Even before election day on Tuesday? Can you imagine that? I think that would be the best result of the election day for the... <laughs> Can I get a witness in the house of God? That would be the best result of the election day. I vote for the rapture! But if it could happen any moment, and we believe it does, and the first thing that takes place after the rapture is the judgment seat of Christ, this judgment could take place as soon as... Next week. So, are you ready? Are you ready for this examination? Are you ready to give an account of your life? Are you ready to stand before God and for Him to reveal everything about you? I mean, no, we need to talk about this. Now, let's talk about who's going to be there. Remember, this is a judgment for Christians only. So this is just for followers of Jesus. Now, there are not going to be any unbelievers there. They're going to be at the great white throne judgment, which will take place later. We'll talk about that next Sunday. Every person who's ever lived that had an opportunity to serve Jesus but did not will be at the great white throne judgment. Okay? So the judgment seat of Christ is not an examination for your credentials to make it into heaven. Are you in the book or are you not? If you made it to the judgment seat, you made it. But because the judgment seat of Christ is not a place or time for punishment for sins. Because your sins, get this, were already judged on Jesus at the cross. That's the power of the cross. All of your sins were placed upon the cross of Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty for your sin. So this judgment has nothing to do with your sin. That's, oh man, I could get happy about that. That's why we sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound. The grace of God that covers our sins. 
The believer escapes judgment because Jesus has already taken upon himself all the judgment of our sin. But understand, though, that although the judgment seat of Christ is not about our eternal destiny, it does have eternal consequences. The judgment seat of Christ will not determine where you'll spend eternity, but it will determine how you'll spend eternity. So what's the purpose of this judgment then? Well, the purpose of the Bema Seat judgment is an evaluation of our lives, the lives that we've lived following our commitment to Christ. Following the day that we decide to give our lives to Jesus Christ. It's an evaluation of our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, He will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives and then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. So three principles about this day. Here, here's number one. It's a day of accountability. Everybody say accountability. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Somebody asked the great Daniel Webster, Mr. Webster, what do you consider the most, uh, the most important or serious thought that has ever entered your mind? He said, the most solemn thought that has ever entered my mind is my accountability to my maker. We have to give an account of our lives to God by ourselves. How many know the parable of the talents and so many others in the gospel remind us that it's, it is very important how we live. It is very important what we do with our stuff. It's extremely important how we treat other folks. Come on, somebody. Because it's a day of accountability. We live in a culture that says, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. I'm accountable to no one. The, today and the next few Sundays will remind you, all of us are ultimately accountable to God for everything we say, everything we do, and everything we don't do. How many know the opposite of accountability is lawlessness? And that's what is, will be taking place on the earth during the judgment seat. The Antichrist, the spirit of lawlessness, and we see that spirit growing in the world every single day. The spirit of lawlessness says, I can do whatever I want. The result is chaos, and the ultimate result is death. You want to be accountable. It's a day of accountability. But here's, here's, a, here's the good news part of this. Secondly, it's a day of reward. It's a day of reward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. This is why I'm telling you that, that this day, judgment seat day, is going to be a happy day for a lot of people. It's going to be a day of celebration. It's going to be better than the best Christmas you've ever had, better than the best birthday you've ever had, better than winning any prize you've ever won. It's going to be a day of great rewards, better than the best payday, because you're going to be rewarded for all the good things that you have done. I want you to think about the most lavish awards ceremony you've ever seen, the most lavish time where people are honored and recognized. That's the Bema seat. Matter of fact, the Bema is a word that Paul borrowed from the Corinthian uh, city area because it was a place where athletes would come. It was an elevated platform where they would be honored and recognized before everyone else and they would receive the victor's crown that wreathed around their head. That's the purpose of the Bema seat is to honor and to reward. Anybody want to be rewarded? Four of you want to be rewarded. I'm going to go ahead and confess. I want to, I want to be famous on that day. I, I, want to be, I want to be rewarded on that day, right? I'm living for that day. So we should kind of figure out what it is we'll be rewarded for, right? We should probably talk about how God is going to reward people. Well, let's talk about that. What's going, what are you going to be rewarded for? First of all, you're going to be rewarded for spiritual disciplines. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, Paul says, Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. What's he talking about? He's talking about spiritual discipline, right? Prayer, Bible study, fasting, meditation, seeking God, 
the disciplines you put into your life to become more like Jesus, Paul says you're going to get rewarded for that. All those times you got up early to pray. All those times you cracked open your Bible to read the word of life. All those times you got involved in a Bible study. You're going to be rewarded every single time. That's good news. I'm going to be rewarded for the disciplines. So this is the shameless promotion of Grace 201 this afternoon. Come on, somebody. This is the class where we help you learn the spiritual disciplines. So, so this class could be uh, said, uh, you know, uh, why do we teach the spiritual disciplines? Because we want you to be rewarded in this life, becoming like Christ, and in the next. So we could call this Bema Judgment Preparation Class 201. <laughs> Three o'clock. You don't have to register. Just come. All right. You're going to be rewarded for holiness. Did you know that? You're going to be rewarded for holiness. You're going to be rewarded for living a holy, disciplined, scriptural life. When you exercise self-control in order to serve the Lord, you're going to be rewarded for your separation. I said you're going to be rewarded for your separation. That's what the word holy means. Separate, right? When you choose to stay home, when everybody else is out participating in sin, when you choose to distance yourself from a friendship because they keep drawing you in to compromising situations, God says, I'm going to see that and I'm going to reward that every single time. Oh, I'm in the wrong church today. I think this is exciting. You're encouraged. God's going to reward me. How many know it's not very popular in these days to choose holiness, but it's going to be very popular in heaven on judgment day. You're going to be rewarded, number three, for your endurance and your faithfulness. James 1 verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test. Everybody say stood the test. He will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. You will be rewarded for every trial you suffered through. You will be rewarded for being faithful through that trial. For holding on even when you felt like quitting. The Bible says you will receive a crown of life. For many believers at this judgment we're going to, I want you to imagine this scene with me, millions of believers and followers of Jesus. And let's say Jesus calls the name of, of some unnamed Syrian Christian that we do not know right now. And he comes before God and for everybody. And we hear his story, how he gave his life for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I guarantee you there won't be a dry eye in the place, but we'll all stand and celebrate the one who endured great trials and great affliction and great trouble, that Chinese house church pastor who who endured persecution from the government we're going to stand we're going to applaud and God is going to honor him some here are enduring sickness you're fighting cancer you're struggling to recover from the effects of a stroke some are enduring the loss of loved ones some have endured great tragedy you don't understand it all but you haven't quit and you haven't given up on God. God sent me here today to tell you, you're going to be rewarded for that. All those sleepless nights, you cried and you cried and you cried, God, why, why, why? The Bible says there's going to be a day when he's going to make everything right. He's going to make everything right. Don't you quit. You're going to be rewarded, number four, for winning people to Jesus. Did you know you're going to be rewarded for winning people to Jesus? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 describes people being rewarded for those we've won to Christ or helped win to Christ. If you win somebody to Jesus, you share your faith with them, you're part of the process of then coming to Christ, the Bible says you're going to be rewarded. I wonder if it's going to go something like this. Wayne Murray... Please step forward. <laughs> oh, man. I can only imagine. <laughs> How many know the words of that song would be different than the one we sung? And God says, Is there anybody here today because of this man? Is there anybody here in heaven today because of what he did? Did he share the gospel with any of you? Did he pray for any of your salvation? Did he invite you? Did he invest in you? Is there anybody here? 
<laughs> I'm going to go, anybody? How many know on that day, you want to quote LeBron James? Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six. I want to see throngs of folks there because I invested in their lives. I prayed for them. I invited them. I shared Jesus with them. Come on, somebody. I can't imagine what it would be like if we got there and God asked this question about you and no one spoke up. So if you're not sure <laughs> that anybody would speak up on your judgment day, on your way out today, pick up some invite cards. I'm not kidding you. Invite some folks to church next week to hear about the great white throne. Two weeks from today, the 10 witnesses, they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and many of them are going to give their hearts to the Lord. All right. You do it because you love them, because God loves them and because you'll be rewarded on judgment day. The Bible says you're going to be rewarded for living in expectation of Christ's return, for looking and loving his appearing. The Bible says you're going to be uh, that shepherds are going to be rewarded for their faithfulness, for their obedient shepherding. How many know that's the ultimate pastor appreciation day? All right, only spiritual shepherds get to be rewarded for that. Did you know that 1,700 pastors left the ministry every month last year? So thank you for your appreciation. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. It makes all the difference in the world. But if you're listening to me, pastor, by internet, or maybe you made your way here today, I want to encourage you. There is an, a, there's a reward awaiting you if you will just hang on. Don't you quit. Don't you lay down the gauntlet. Once you serve Jesus, just hang on, and he'll reward you for your faithfulness. Give it up for every pastor you know. Would you do that right now? You're going to be rewarded for every act of kindness and every act of generosity toward other people. Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay. When will he repay? When is payday? It may not always be in this life. Matter of fact, I got a feeling when we get to heaven, we're going to wish we would have waited for a delayed payment option. For every act of kindness toward those who are needy, you will be rewarded. For every dollar given to missions, every offering you gave to one day to feed the world last week, you're going to get rewarded for that. For every time Nathan and Ken and Charlene and others fed homeless people, they did it yesterday. For every time the Carey family provides clothes and furniture with their volunteers for Arab families, every time you went to a nursing home and held their hand or sang a song to them, every time you went over to a widow's house and raked her leaves or mowed her grass, or every time you stopped in your busy schedule, just like the Good Samaritan walking down the road and and you saw somebody hurting and you stopped to help them for every missions trip you went on and fed people who are hungry and gave them the gospel. God knows, God sees, God records it all in his book and you will be rewarded. Matthew 10, 42. Jesus said, if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Are you getting this? Hey, there's a few ways to make your judgment day better here in the next few weeks. We are collecting backpacks for the homeless ministry. They need another hundred used or new. Bring them to church, put them in the hub. All right. Uh, we're collecting noodles for the refuge for their turkey Thanksgiving uh, giveaway. So bring your noodles. We are the noodle church. Are you proud to be part of the noodle church? We're the church that brings the noodles to provide meals for hundreds of families. There's going to be a great turkey giveaway here on November 23rd. So if you are a turkey or you own some, send them this way. And then pretty soon we're going to be giving away gifts to 200 kids for the world's largest Christmas party. Why would I want to do those things? Well, first of all, it's because Jesus would do those things, and Jesus is in us, but you're going to be rewarded for those things. You're going to be rewarded for your generosity. Whoever sows sparingly, 2 Corinthians 9, will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Every man should give what he's decided to give in his heart. I mean, no, too many preachers preach this as if God only rewards us on this side of eternity, and we turn it into a slot machine verse. Put this in, you get this back. Come on, somebody. Remember, we said in the last series that whenever Jesus talked about money, he always connected it with what? Eternity. He always connected our stuff with eternity. So guess what? If you sow generously here on the earth, you're going to reap generously in eternity. Notice God does not decide the reward. Oh, get this. 
This verse says, God does not decide the reward. You do. You get to decide how many rewards you're going to get on Judgment Day by giving sparingly or giving generously. Right? Remember, God's not concerned about the dollar amount. He's concerned about the percentage or the part of your heart that you're giving away. And he says, when you give, you lay up for yourselves treasures where? When you give, you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where are we going to get those treasures? I got a feeling it's going to be at the Bema seat. I made this statement a couple weeks ago that perhaps tithing may be God's eternal savings account. And now I'm even more convinced. There's so many reasons to give, right? Because God gave to us. Because we want to be like God. Because giving redirects our hearts to the right priorities. We give because there's a need, right? We give because we love. But also we give because we are laying up treasures in heaven. So when we give, don't think three years ahead. Don't even think 30 years ahead. Think 300 million years ahead. Philippians chapter 4, Paul commends the Philippians. Look at this. It was right and commendable and noble of you to contribute to my needs and to share my difficulties. You sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your what? You have an eternal savings account? <laughs> you have an eternal savings account, Paul says. And I wish, wouldn't it be great if we got a statement from heaven every once in a while? <laughs> Instead of from the church, right? This is your giving statement. This is your bank statement. This is your eternal giving account, or your eternal credit account for your generosity, your heart to share. On the judgment seat, you're going to find out how much is in your account. Anybody want it to be full? Watch this. You're going to be rewarded for being planted in the local church. And it's in the Bible. Psalm 92, verse 13. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. What do they do in courts? They pass judgment. If you don't believe me, you look at John Bevere, what he said in his book, Driven by Eternity. He says, an aspect of the courts of our God is the judgment seat of Christ. So we will flourish now and at the judgment seat of Christ if we have been firmly planted in the local church. <laughs> I love this. Notice, it does not say that going to church will make you flourish at the judgment seat. The verse says, planted in the church. Because if you're planted in the church, all of the other things we've been talking about are going to happen in your life. You're going to be regularly provoked and you're going to grow. Come on, somebody. Remember, the church was not man's idea. It was Jesus' idea. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. So how can you build God's church if you're never there? <laughs> Stop being a spectator. Start being a participator and help us build the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, there's going to be a lot of free agent Christians on Judgment Day. They kind of, I go whenever I feel like it. Sometimes I go, and sometimes I go here, sometimes I go there. You know, sometimes I go to Target, sometimes I go to Walmart, sometimes I go to Meyer, sometimes I go to Grace, sometimes I go to that church. You're never going to grow up like that. You're never going to establish any roots like that. You're never going to be planted in the house of God like that. Many are going to be shocked at the judgment seat of Christ to find out how important the church was in the plan of God. God has ordained the church to be the hope of the world. It's a place where you grow up spiritually. It's a place where your gifts are developed and nurtured. The Bible calls us co-laborers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the church is where I learn to work together, to contribute, to serve, and to bless. The reality is, listen, the reality is many Christians want to play in their own sandbox. And I want to do it by my own rules. I want to do it whenever I feel like it. I don't like the decisions you're making. I don't like the way you're doing it. Then you go in the ministry and you start leading a church the way God called you to do it. If you're planted here, let's serve together. That's a good place to give God praise. Amen.
The sad fact is much of the ministry of Jesus Christ is not being accomplished in our communities because of severely disabled churches. They're not disabled because of ineffective leadership, but by professing believers who are living independently of each other. If you're firmly planted in the church, you're going to be rewarded. You're going to be rewarded for serving others. Hebrews 6, God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers. By the way, Grace 101 is this afternoon, too. It's 3 o'clock. Judgment Day upgrade. That's what we'll start calling it, Judgment Day upgrade classes. God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you've worked for him and how you've shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. God says you're going to be rewarded for serving other people, especially serving other believers in Jesus, praying for people, teaching people, and interceding for people, meeting people's needs, small group leaders, servants of Jesus Christ. You're going to be rewarded. Matthew 25, verse 21, Jesus says, Jesus says on that day, you're going to hear these words, well done, good and faithful. Well done, good and faithful preacher. No. Well done, good and faithful singer. That's not what you're going to hear. Well done, good and faithful usher. Well done, good and faithful business owner. He is not going to say any of those things. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, because that's the heart that he wants in every area that we desire to be rewarded in. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, this one word serving leads us to the last point of this message because it helps us understand the next purpose of this beam of judgment. The last purpose of this judgment day is that it does serve as an examination. It's a day of examination. Now, there's a lot of people here today. You should be very encouraged about the upcoming beam of seat judgment because you are going to be richly rewarded. I was tempted to call out people that I know will be richly rewarded, but I don't want to embarrass you, but there are a lot of people. There's, there's going to be a ton of people from this church who are going to be richly rewarded on a judgment day because you have made eternal investments in building your house for eternity. I, I, I applaud you for that. The goal is for all of us to be rich on judgment day, right? You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be worried. You can be confident in this day because you're going to be rewarded. But we do need to remember this last point is kind of a big deal because it's a day of examination. And some of us here might be concerned. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. You also are God's building. But each one must be careful how he builds. For God has already placed Jesus Christ as the one and only foundation. And no other foundation can be laid. Some will use gold or silver or precious stones in building on the foundation. Others will use wood or grass or straw. And the quality of each person's work will be seen when the day of Christ exposes it. For on that day, fire will reveal everyone's work. The fire will test it and show its real quality. If what was built on the foundations survives the fire, the builder will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned up, then he'll lose it. But he himself will be saved as if he had escaped through fire. Just keeping it real. <laughs> you know what? I was thinking about this. It's kind of like the story of the three pigs. The three little pigs. You know, one built his house out of straw. The other one built his house out of sticks. The other one built his house out of bricks. And the big bad wolf, huff and puff, are going to blow your house in. Now listen, obviously we're not going to have the big bad wolf in heaven. Thank God for that. But the test will be the fire of God to see if what you have built, your eternal house, your rewards are going to stand the test of fire. Pastor, what are you talking about? Let's read that same passage again in a modern day paraphrase. To put it another way, you are God's house. Take particular care in picking out your building materials. Eventually, there's going to be an inspection. If you use cheaper, inferior materials, you'll be found out. The inspection will be thorough, thorough and rigorous. You won't get by with a thing. If, you, if your work passes inspection, fine. If it doesn't, your part of the building will be, will be torn out and started over. But listen to this. But you won't be torn out. You'll survive. 
but just barely. Amazingly, some people will stand before God on judgment day. And remember, you've made it to heaven because Christ has judged your sins on the cross. But when it comes to, rewar to rewards, amazingly, some people will receive nothing. No commendation, no reward, no crowns. Your house is burned down. Second John verse eight, look to yourselves that we do not lose the things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. It's possible to lose everything that you worked for. All the stuff you've done, all the generosity you've shown, all the places you've served could mean, could mean nothing if you did it with the wrong motivation. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. To me, this is the most sobering part of this message. The reality is, yes, we'll be in heaven. Yes, you'll have eternal life. And trust me, that's phenomenal. But the Bible says, I didn't say this, the Bible says, some folks will be there on judgment day and you'll be ashamed. Before Jesus, before the heavenly throne, to receive nothing. Ashamed because we're going to be judged for every idle word and all the gossip and all the bitter words and the sarcasm that you've spoken are going to be exposed. Ashamed at the amount of time you wasted on things that don't matter. Ashamed at our selfishness for all the times we had opportunity to be generous and be an unwise steward. Ashamed at our callousness when needs were clearly presented to us and we did nothing about it. Ashamed at our conceitedness for not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with neighbors, with coworkers, with friends, with relatives. Luke 8, verse 17, whatever is hidden away will be brought out into the open, and whatever is covered up will be found and brought to light. Be careful then how you listen, because whoever has something will be given more, but whoever has nothing will have it taken away from him, even the little that he has. Here comes the so what part. Okay, pastor. I believe what you're saying is true. This judgment day is coming. So what? Let me give you the so what. First of all, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not going to be there. There will be another judgment reserved for you. We'll talk about next week called the great white throne judgment. And if you do make it through the rapture, you're probably going to die. And then face God at the great white throne judgment. See, Pastor, you, you're trying to scare me. No, I'm not. I'm actually not. I'm actually simply trying to tell you the truth. There's a test that's coming. And you should be prepared. You should dislike the people who refuse to tell you these things. You should run from folks who say, you know, questioning my motives. You know, the pastor's doing this, blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. I'm telling you what the Bible says. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And you know what? If you'll listen to your conscience, if you'll listen to the Spirit of God speaking to you, you know it's true. You are going to give an account of your life. And if you're not right with God, here's what I would do if I were you. I wouldn't take a chance on another moment. I wouldn't take a chance on another second taking for granted the grace and the kindness of God through the cross of Jesus Christ to receive you into his family. If you're here today and you need to make it right with God, today's your day. 
Today's your opportunity to choose Jesus Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed all over this room and nobody's leaving. Believers in Jesus, you're praying. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, you know what? God's spirit is speaking to me. I need to make things right with God today. I'm not sure where I'm going to spend my judgment day. I want to spend it at the beam of seat. I want to trust Jesus to save me. If you're here today and say, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? Would you put your hand up real high right now? Put it up real high. Put it up. God bless you. God bless you. Are there others? Are there others? Yes. Are there others? Yes. I'm waiting just a moment. I need to make it right with God, Pastor. And I need to do it today. Hands are raised. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. Those that raise your hand, would you look straight at me? In just a moment, I'm going to have you come. And I want you to come right over here to my right, to your left. And there's going to be some pastors that are going to pray with you in just a moment. Because we're all going to pray. Everybody else, look at me. I want, you, I want to read to you one more verse, and then we're all going to pray. And this is 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. The scripture says, As we live in God, our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. And we can face Him with confidence because we are like Christ here in the world. I want you to, I want you to hear, hear this verse. This is, this is awesome. We will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence. Why? Because we're like Christ here in the world. Say, Pastor, why, what, what's so important about this? Here's the deal. God gives us the opportunity to judge ourselves before he judges us. What should I do with this message here today, Pastor? Well, hopefully it will motivate you. It will prepare you. But the more than that, it will cause you to begin to examine your own life. And say, God, search me. Holy Spirit, reveal to me any impurity in my life. Any impure motives, wrong attitudes, bitterness, unforgiveness. Anything that won't stand the test on the day of judgment. I want you to change me. Change my heart. Change my attitude. Examine me, God. And the Bible says, as you judge yourself, you're not going to be judged. Come on, somebody. You get that? You judge yourself before the judgment comes. Everybody standing in this room today. I've tried to leave ample time here this morning for us to do business with God. I'd like to encourage you not to prepare to leave but to prepare to spend some time getting ready for this judgment day. If you're not right with God, in just a moment, I want you to come over here and our pastors are gonna pray with you. If you say, Pastor, I know I'm right with God, but there's some, I need to do some business with God. And let's just be honest, that's all of us. That's 100% of us. God, work in my heart, change my life today. Are you ready to pray? Amen. If you can't make it down here to the altar, if you want to pray in your seat, that's fine. That's good. But the most important thing is for you to do business with God today. Let's pray. Come. 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 Let's come. Make your way to the altar here this morning.